Okay, hi everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is actually the last uh, QRMS session of the 13-14 academic year, which seems a little crazy to me. Um, as you know, QRMS, as I hope you know, QRMS has sessions twice a semester, um, typically in uh, October, uh, excuse me, September, November, February, and April. And we are uh, so excited for this one to be talking about digital storytelling. Um, Dr. Marty Atanas and David, uh, excuse me, Daniel. Um, Marty, that's my brother. <laughs> he's like super <laughs> impressive. More impressive. <laughs> no, 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 it's impossible. Uh, Daniel Winkenshaker, uh, who is at the Center for Digital Storytelling, and Marty is with um, the Department of Anthropology at the downtown campus, the University of Colorado, Denver. And uh, we're so pleased to have them here. They actually gave a talk. Um, what was it, probably about a year and a half ago, two years ago, on digital storytelling, and it was so well received that we wanted to have them back. Because as you may know, uh, people, there's a growing interest in qualitative methods, um, and particularly in innovative qualitative methods. Um, people are looking for new and interesting ways to gather data on health and, and, um, and you know, ways, different ways to do analysis with, uh, with health data. So we're gonna be talking about the Center for, uh, I mean, the um, digital storytelling as a method to do that. Um, we're so pleased to welcome you guys, and um, as with other QRMF sessions, I want to ask you to hold your questions, both in person and on the phone, until the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation. Um, that's not ideal, certainly, but we need to do that. It makes things a little bit easier for folks uh, on the web conference for the dialogue. So hold your questions, and then we'll have a little time at the end for the Q&A. Um, I guess the last thing I would have to say is uh, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet. Please uh, sign up or you know, just indicate that you were here. And if you're not already on the email uh, distribution list, please add your email if you'd like to uh, learn about future presentations. Okay? So thanks so much, and I'm looking forward to a great presentation. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, so I'm Daniel Weinschenker from, I work for the Center for Digital Storytelling. We're a 501c3 um, located in Berkeley, California. And we've been around now, um, we actually just celebrated as a nonprofit 20 years of being around doing innovative media that was innovative at the time when we started, um, which was that we were committed to doing social justice based community participatory media projects. So. Um, like uh, other methods like photo voice where you go off into communities and let people tell, author, capture their own stories. Um, we started that practice the year, or this practice, the year that the very first video editing software became available on a public computer, like on a personal computer. And um, it was very specific to that because before that time, and actually even now, 20 years later, after that software has been developed, many people don't author their own movies. Um, they may author emails still, you know, or text. Um, they may make a slideshow, um, but rarely do they make um, sometimes what might be termed as reflective media in this format. They make kind of the fast food of what can be made in media. Like, let me light myself on fire and videotape it, and I'm gonna go put it on, say, on uh, YouTube. Or uh, they might make something like, how many of you have, on your own computer, grabbed a bunch of pictures from someone's birthday or, some, or an event and slapped a song on it and exported that as a video to share? Oftentimes there's a lot of authorship that way, but how many of you have made a movie? <laughs> Raise a hand. Well, some of you have participated in one of our workshops, but for most of us, the gap between those who are producers and those who are consumers is almost just as big as it ever was. Um, even though these tools have been available to most of us, and certainly we have the content, we have stories to tell, even if you say, oh, I don't have any stories. That's what you do all day long. So I'm not gonna go into convincing you of that, but I'll say that, um, we as an organization believe that everyone has a million stories that only they can tell. And that is essentially what we do in our workshops, which started off as just these workshops where people came to us from various um, you know, places, either around the country, various backgrounds, came and participated in a three-day workshop 
um, where people came, either had a story that they knew they wanted to tell, but more often than not found a story that they knew they needed to tell. They would bring pictures, they would bring letters from their archives, they would bring their grandfather's old trumpet, they would bring whatever it was that they wanted, and we would teach them software, teach them a lot about storytelling, and together, at, by the end of that three days, they would have made their own, authored their own short movie with their voice telling a story and then some visuals to support that. Um, and then over time, this was before the web, so there wasn't a whole lot of sharing of these stories. They were mostly meant for you just to be able to make something and take home on um, like a zip disk back in those days. Anyone remember a zip disk? Yeah. A floppy? <laughs> or a VHS tape, actually. That was fairly innovative. And then, um, you know, so over time that's, that's changed, especially um, in how the types of people that are coming to us to do this work. So more often than not, it's not the public workshops that we're doing, even though we continue to run those. It's private workshops with very specific groups around the world that either the process itself, so I do want to draw a distinction here right off the bat, that there are two things that we're talking about here. One is digital storytelling, which is a method and a process. The other is digital story, which is the product, one of the products, that comes out of that process, hopefully. If you've run a good workshop, you get some stories at the end. Um, and so oftentimes people might see these stories and say, oh, that's so great that you made these. But yeah, you're that organization that makes all these stories. And we're like, no, we're not. We don't make anything. We make a space. And we make an environment and kind of a set of guidelines for people um, that can be altered. And within that space, and if it's done right and hopefully ethically, which is very important with the very specific groups that we work with, um, then you get these products at the end. True. But I'm going to be mostly talking, and, and that, this is one way in which research has kind of come in. Certainly people are interested in what happens to people when they author their own stories. So what's the impact that your own authorship about your own life has on your identity, who you think you are? Are you or are you not the stories you choose to tell about yourself? There's, so there's research into that, and we're not – and Marty does some of that, and he'll talk about that in terms of what's the impact of the workshop on the people participating in the workshop. But then there's a lot of interest in how are these stories authored by these livers, the livers of these situations or these conditions, or wh whether you're working with refugees, whether you're working with um, an obese population that has diabetes, whether you're working with um, cancer survivors, whether you're working, and these are all groups that we do a lot of work with, refugees, youth in foster care, um, perpetrators of gender violence, survivors of gender violence, and kind of on and on down the line, um, kind of what's the impact when showing these stories, if you're in a project where these stories are going to be public, again, we started before the web, now with the web, people are very, and organizations are interested in using these as teaching tools to affect policymakers, and kind of on and on down the line. And you can kind of see that in this handout that I gave out. And for those of you on the webinar, um, it's the it's two sided. So it's the impacts of if you kind of go across this little caterpillar looking thing, you'll see impact. And we'll talk a little bit about impact of both going from product or process to the product. Um, and so just delving a little bit into that. So I'm going to just describe, so over the, these 20 years, we've done now an extensive amount of work, and a lot of it has come um, in public health and healthcare. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit just about our process, and but mostly I'm going to leave, hopefully leave more time to these guys for them to describe to you what it's kind of like to then implement this and actually use this for research, which Dr. Dr. Artonius has been really successful in doing. So I'm not going to go through all these slides, but there's a lot of talk going on about, um, about the use of this and, um, and how there's this melding of, of kind of public health, public policy, and social justice that are coming together in projects, whether it's photo voice or digital storytelling, that, um, that require something of the people being researched, you know, and that they're able to author their own experience. 
in a way that you as a documentarian or a researcher are not authoring it for them. Uh, so I talked a little bit about this, what digital storytelling is. Um, and I'm just going to bring this up. So this is kind of what happens in what sometimes are three-day workshops. We, we sometimes have workshops that are longer. Some workshops people choose to run once a month for six months. Every sat, you know, one Saturday a month for six months. So there was like a longitudinal study uh, in digital storytelling with the refugee group in Ireland, for example. Um, and these components are always part of it. So it's talking about the genre, the thing that you're asking them to do, which is um, that we do ask, like there's kind of one hard rule that we have about our workshops, which is that this is not a place to come and speak as an authority of something that's other than your life. <laughs> so <laughs> when we get, um, certainly there's, that's hard for some people to do, especially if they're used to writing um, research papers, for example. Um, but getting back into the personal in terms of, you know, what, what, what is the impact that this research has had on you, for example, might be something that a researcher who is interested in digital storytelling and comes to one of our public workshops just to learn about it and actually practice it themselves, which we think is ethically responsible to do the work that you're going to be asking a group of people to do first. So they may come and do that. So what happens in here is the rule is tell a story that only you can tell. That's our rule. How you want to use visuals is up to you. How you want to kind of author that story, we certainly have guidelines on, not guidelines, but suggestions for, and they're kind of covered in a text that we have called the seven steps of digital storytelling. And that's part of uh, the textbook that we give to all students. And actually a sample of it is available on our website if you're interested in it. Um, it's called the Digital Storytelling Cookbook. Um, we then ask people to share their stories in a group. <clears throat> so that means either people have come with a story or they have maybe come with a story and thrown that story away and decided upon another story, which happens about 80% of the time for people. Either they've come with something and they change, or maybe they didn't have something to begin with at all. But usually they end up telling a story different than the one they thought they were going to tell. And um, there could be a lot of research in, in terms of how, does, how do groups impact individuals. So when one person starts telling a story that is more emotionally vulnerable than, than, than someone else, does their story change? You know, how, how do those... How do those dynamics work? And that's actually, I think it's pretty interesting. But the, the, photo, the stories that usually come out of our workshops are usually incredibly um, deep and um, personal for people to make. So we have this place where everyone shares their story and gets feedback. If they want feedback, they get to lead what they get in that process. And this is all on day one. So in the three-day digital storytelling workshop, we don't touch a computer for day one, which freaks people out because some people are like, well, I came here to learn video software. And we're like, mm, yeah. <laughs> You'll see that you actually came here to learn something else. <laughs> and you will learn video editing software in the process. But it's kind of like learning a language. Um, you need to learn it. You need to need to learn it in order to learn it best. So when people need to complete a story, and it's almost like their life depends on it, they need to tell this story, then they'll learn the software. So we kind of use that Habitat for Humanity model where you don't just teach someone to use a hammer. They're, they don't have a home, and they're so cold that the place that they're living, they don't have any heat in there, and their shampoo is frozen when they wake up in the morning. That's when they learn to use a hammer best, when they're building their house. Okay, so we do that. We guide people through some image stuff. Day two, we uh, record their voiceovers. Oftentimes their stories change from day one to day two. In the shower sometimes, <laughs> at night with a bottle of wine, whenever it does. But usually the, between day one and day two comes like the real depth and honesty into a story. And so then they tackle that. We record their voices for them. Um, 
and then we teach them a software. It doesn't matter which software necessarily, a video editing software to let them author. And they spend the next day and a half putting that thing together, and by the end, they have made a movie. And it's clunky sometimes. I mean, it, and, and this is why oftentimes I think people are finding that these stories are very effective, and it's actually because they're clunky. They're a little clunky. It's like a baby walking for the first time. We've watched video for a whole long time, like all of our lives. Um, but even though we've watched it, when we first start speaking it, uh, it's clunky, just like speaking English for an infant or a toddler. Um, so these are not super overproduced pieces of media. They're underproduced, if anything. Um, and they're people's real voices. We don't have a voiceover person doing your voice. You do your own voice. It's all you. Um, your pictures are yours. If it's an old picture, we don't spend two hours there trying to make it look new and get a wrinkle out of it. It has a wrinkle in it. It is what it is. And so um, we spend a lot of time doing that. And then at the end, we pop popcorn, and people watch their stories up on the big screen. And then usually they're like, I have to go back to my life now. <laughs> How dare you? Um, so, as I said, we, we've spent um, two decades now rolling this out in various contexts um, and for various you know, types of clients. Uh, and there's been a ton of work here at Anschutz already in digital storytelling. A program with the Department of Nursing called Nurse Story, which is a reflective practice program. Um, and someone here participated in um, the Advancing Care Together program out of the Department of Family Medicine, evaluating, trying to get behavioral health into uh, primary care clinics around the state. We did recordings. Um, we went around and kind of did this digital storytelling model with both physicians in those clinics where they were trying out innovations and trying to get mental health into there. I can show these so that you can see them, maybe. Let's see, boom, all right. Um, so working with both um, patients at those clinics to see what they were lacking in mental health um, coverage, uh, mental health integration, the ability to get the services that they need and be screened for them. So those things going around the state, um, same here in uh, the Center for American Indian and Alaska Native Health. So there's a lot of stuff going on here on campus already. The lead students all make digital stories about being involved in advocacy work in the community and what that impact has had on them. So trying to get people to think about what care is what does it mean to take care of someone, to be a doctor, your missions for advocacy and making people well. So I'm going to go ahead and show one story. Um, this is actually from a project from the um, Asian Pacific Islanders Wellness Center in San Francisco. And so a lot of people made stories as part of this project. This was specific to HIV AIDS um, and living with that within the Asian Pacific Islander kind of community there. So I'm going to show this story so you guys can see it. I think it's a really cool story. And then I'll probably end a little bit after that, let Marty get a go. Your HIV test came back positive. Two months ago, I graduated from medical school. I came to San Francisco to start my residency, and I thought that here, in one of the pastel-colored Victorians that lined the city's foggy streets, I'd finally find love. Crumbled. In the space of a moment, all my pastel-colored hopes caved in. Lost. Everything lost. I had crumbled on the floor. A 
pair of arms helped me stand up. It was my doctor. He held me in a tight hug and he whispered fiercely in my ear, all the truly important things in life you haven't lost. If it's your career, you can still have that. And if it's love you're looking for, you can still find that. I heard his words, but I couldn't believe him. Three years had passed. By that time, I'd finished my residency and had just started a fellowship to train as an HIV physician. One day, my mentor asked me, is it triggering for you being HIV positive to work so closely with other HIV positive patients? I thought quietly for a long moment. Sometimes, if it feels right, I would tell my patients that I also shared this, the virus. Why? Oh, I suppose that I wanted them to know that if I can make it, they can too. No, I replied. No, Dana, actually, actually it's deeply joyful. Maybe, maybe because what we have to offer is something that's fundamentally hopeful. And as I spoke, it dawned on me that those fiercely whispered words from long ago had somehow come true. My career was taking off. I was on meds and in the best health that I'd ever been in. I was still looking for love, but optimistic that I would find it. All the pieces of my life were coming together. Two days ago, I met a patient in the hospital. He had just been diagnosed with pneumonia and AIDS. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm going to be your new doctor, and I'm also HIV positive. You're going to be all right. All the truly important things in life you haven't lost. Okay, that's an example of one of the stories and from the project. Um, and if we have time, I'm going to show you some other projects, and I can show you other examples of massive grants um, for research that have been written that include this methodology and the products at the end uh, as um, you know components of the research. So here's one done with uh, NIMH funded to do work with women with depression. We should hit up the depression center right there in rural Appalachia. But as an example, here's one. And I also included in the email this, this article that I didn't print out here, um, but this is one written by one of our partners that um, we recently got a Ford Foundation grant with to do sexual reproductive health with um, Latina uh, young women in Massachusetts. So thanks for having me. I'll be back when there are time for questions. And Marty. A round of applause for Daniel. How about uh, hearing him talk? Do you have more to say? No, I was just going to say, and so I'll talk afterwards, too, um, about our public workshops, if people here are interested in signing up for one of those. But then that's a good entree into thinking, do I want to run a project with this? 
um, is to kind of try it out for yourself and figure that out. So we have like monthly workshops that we run in Denver and around the country because we're all over the place. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, our connection is I got to Denver in um, fall of 08, and I was able to get some funding and um, uh, do some digital storytelling and hire Daniel and CDS. And so uh, our connection is, um, you know, doing a couple of research projects to collect the data, analyze the data, and then, of course, the gold standard is disseminate it and publish it. So what I'm going to do is give you a little backstory, and of course, um, I'm a strong advocate for the model that CDS um, applies, and I encourage you to think big, meaning pay the 500 bucks, take a workshop if you haven't. Um, I'm sure you can make an arrangement if you can demonstrate, like me, that you're low income. You can maybe uh, get a, a scholarship. Um, also think big, there's half a million dollar grants available. And so I'm going to talk about the process, um, the journey that I took to get where I'm at, but also to state that I'm a resource for people and I'm here to also be educated by people who are maybe doing this thing differently, applying digital storytelling, uh, or also have some um, uh, curious questions or points they want to uh, talk about in terms of how can we maybe take the CDS model and do something different with it, maybe something more experimental or something hybrid or what I do a lot is the one-on-one -on -one digital storytelling. So in my classes, um, you know, the way I understand my role here is we all have this moral compass and I tend to think of myself as like a magnet or like an organizer to get you to sort of turn your moral compass, okay, on many different levels. To, get, to, to let go of this idea that the written word is the gold standard in the academic environment. So the visual text is incredibly important and it should be looked at on the equal playing field, including peer-reviewed visual text. So that's one sort of assumption. The other assumption is, at least the work that I do, and my colleagues, is we look at this stuff as a, as a, a vehicle to promote social justice reduce health equities, you know, promote health equities, re reduce social injustice, promote social justice. And so you may see us here talking, but you also may see us in the hallways marching in support of janitors at the med school. And so this whole approach is really important in terms of the undercurrent with our digital storytelling stuff. And then thirdly, um, how do we recognize that for this stuff to really take off, there needs to be, in my view, at the concept level, the digital storytellers involved in the construction of a proposal. I think you'll get buy-in, and I think it helps serve the mission of the university, which is to contribute to wellness in the community, which I think we can agree that our university does poorly, in my own personal view. So I think from the concept level, getting relationships built where you can have people input into the construction of the proposals. Um, so here's a, a slide I thought I'd start with. Uh, I also have a, a kind of a dormant organization called the Center for Excellence in Digital Storytelling. And it's really just to get together a loose group of ragtag people who like digital storytelling. And it's been dormant because I got a Ford grant. Um, uh, I'm one of the four um, recipients, and I'll talk about that and who's involved. Uh, and so that has been really overwhelming to administer the grant and, of course, to get the grant and um, to deal with $10 receipts and, you know, it's a half a million dollars, so it's just incredibly complex, but it's also fun and celebratory. The only way I could do my work is I have a partner in a high school. So the grant specifically deals with Latinas age 14 to 21 doing three workshops, presenting space for them to tell their own stories about sexual and reproductive health. And so I have a gatekeeper, a collaborator named Danica, and she's a high school um, art therapist teacher at Florence Crittenden. And so we are doing one third of this project, which is through the Ford, uh, to get all this data and then sort of influence the context in which stigma is discussed but also to try to influence the context or terrain in which policy is made that affects access to healthcare for Latinas um, and teen moms specifically. So why this slide is important, because I plug my own group, dscoalition.org, but also that the work I do is collaborative. Okay, Danique and I uh, work together, and uh, we just did this presentation, and I let her, you know, with her experiences, frame the presentation. And so my approach to analyzing the data is using critical discourse analysis, and she has this interest in transpersonal language. And so I'm learning from her through her direct experiences with art therapy and running workshops uh, how to actually write up some of this stuff. And so we're currently working on, uh, you know, drafting some papers that came that come out of the project we're working on, but also visual, like methods pieces to educate others on how to do this and to synthesize the work that we've done in the slide. 
And so why this is important too is because one of the players, YTH at the bottom, it's called Youth Tech and Health, uh, they're one of the players in the Ford project. So we subcontracted them to help create sort of the dissemination or the social media aspect on once you get the stories made, how do you actually get them out there? And how do you actually not have Marty in his office at the downtown campus getting them out there, but have the storytellers themselves getting the stuff out there so you have this peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer advocacy? Um, and then the other thing is in terms of collaboration and community-driven digital storytelling, which is the approach that I take, Danica, she couldn't come. And so through Facebook, I'm like, oh, I wish you could be here. And so I wanted her to speak. And so this text is from yesterday. And one of the key things is toward the bottom is from our experience at Flowcrit with the students, they are unaware, the students are unaware of how their experiences fit into the social challenges we are looking into. So underlining the experiences we are looking for is not man manipulative but informative. And I think the manipulative word itself is really interesting because the community work is really a hard nut to crack because there's a lot of bad practices and a lot of poor work that's been done. And so building that trust with community groups, it just takes a long time. And, and typically, I think about five years to get enough trust to be able to do uh, projects that work well. In other words, you're not just there to milk them for their stories. And so this I wanted to just put up there because it's part of the context in which I do my work. I'm creating space to meet people, do projects, get some stories made, but also then bring it to the end of writing papers and then also provide leadership at both levels. I'm learning a ton from her, a new method, transpersonal language analysis, and then also she's getting opportunities to participate in a, in a research project. And if you haven't met her, um, she's great. I encourage you. And this is just a bit about transpersonal stuff. Okay, so the Ford Project. This slide is to demonstrate the complexity of the project, meaning there's Marty, the tech guy, and I have a background as a professional filmmaker, and so I was able to learn through the digital storytelling model on how to integrate my knowledge in documentary filmmaking and go down or up to the level of mini auto-ethnographic personal, you know, first-person story. And so Sheena Bull, the other PI, Evelyn, uh, with the Latino Research and Policy Center, uh, the high school partner, the community partner, Florence Crittenden. And the, one of the end things we're shooting at is how do we actually have some kind of measurable impact on some policy or legislation, which is going from the actual health data, the individual stories, the narratives, the images that people select, to then somehow measuring over time, is there a way to show an association or some way to talk about the influence on legislation, not the stories, alone, but the girls, the, the participants who are uh, making the stories and actually interfacing with the legislators. Um, okay, so it's all about the storytellers, the process. It's not just the product, which I think we all get sort of um, confused about. So these are two storytellers that got to present their work, their two stories at a fundraiser for the high school. So this is just a evidence of like, how do you leave the workshop and then provide other opportunities for storytellers to get their voices heard in venues that they normally don't. And then also, uh, this is unrelated to the Ford. The connection is these are high school girls at Flow Crit, and I'm a person that went to this with the girls, and some of the girls that took the workshop are here in this picture, but this isn't related to the Ford project. But in the future, I mean, in the next six months or so, the Ford project that I'm working on with Sheena Bull and the Latino Research and Policy Center, we are going to have activities like this. In other words, going with your research participants and then interfacing with legislators and try to measure that from the perspective of health. Um, and so um, uh, it's hard for us to tell our own stories. And so to show you how complex it is, here's a sample script. Okay, so it's about 250, 300 words. And I think the biggest problem in academia for us to first learn how to do this stuff, you know, try to make your own story. You know, go into the process, and for those of you that have been really good writers since kindergarten, you to, to write about yourself is really hard. You know, we want to write this jargon, we want to write this technical language, you want to write an essay or a speech. That's not a digital story, necessarily. You could probably do a hybrid sort of academic sort of digital story, but it's probably not the thing that's going to have that emotional tug. And so this is just from the, uh, the workshop with one of the girls at Flowcrit. And um, so our job as scholars is to sort of make sense of it, analyze it. And I don't really do the software that's analyze words and text and all that. I just use interpretive analysis and critical discourse analysis focusing on imagery, trying to understand if you tell me a story that you've never told before about you interfacing with the medical system or some health problem you had going through school, um, what are the images that you select? 
you know, the images that you select say a lot about who you are, and so using critical discourse analysis to unpack that imagery and what does it say about you, but more specifically, what's all the backstory behind the, the imagery? And so these are a couple things we're working on uh, in terms of the storyteller, a little mini biography or ethnographic uh, vignette, uh, discuss more about the themes of stereotypes, self-determination, uh, the metaphors that she used in the story and the imagery. And then Daniel went through this stuff. Uh, in terms of what uh, I did is um, I made a conscious decision with our Ford project not to actually include uh, CDS, and that was because we were finding dur during the concept level we were getting a little bit too heavy with all the subcontractors, and so we wanted to sort of rein it in a bit. A bit. Um, but I have done since coming in fall of 08, I've done six or seven or eight workshops, half of them with C CDS and some mind-blowing stuff. And I have, I have a gentleman here we're going to talk about a workshop he was in, and he's a storyteller, he's a grad student, and we're actually writing a chapter based on the experience that we had in the... Um this is just a visual slide of what I do with Danique in the Flow Crit Project, how do you analyze the narrative. She has this approach, transpersonal language, and we're going to sort of talk about the journey of storytelling. And I think Daniel says that, you say this really well, there's only like two stories, and so she talks about, Danica talks about this journey, but Daniel has a way, can you tell us, like you said there's only like two stories? I didn't make it up, it's this thing that's been passed around writers forever and everybody, I don't know who, who came up with it, but there are two short stories in the world. One is, uh, we went on a trip, and the other one is, a stranger came to town, which just means that all, to me, all stories are about change, right? And it's either you kind of going either geographically or mentally into a new place or something new coming into your space, right? And so if you think about any story you're reading right now or watching, most likely it fits into one or both of those categories. <laughs> Meaning that maybe what separates story from non-story is change. And so we're going to probably analytically apply something a little broader, which is this transpersonal or hero's journey that Danica talks about. Um, so now we're going to go to a different project. This is the Viral Hepatitis Project, funded by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment Viral Hepatitis Program. Um, and so I have a storyteller here and an actual scholar and um, a colleague and a friend. And let me give you a little background. Um, i trying to think how we met. Uh, how do we? I actually received an email, um, and it was, I was asked to disseminate this email looking for people to, to go to a digital storytelling workshop. And um, I was so interested, I didn't just pass it on, I actually volunteered to do this. Um, and that's where actually I met Marty and both, uh, Marty and Daniel. So he's a great sort of like uh, subject. If you want to talk about what's the actual experience of going through the workshop, like I don't know if you came in with a polished story, uh, you didn't. Uh, I came in completely blind. And that's no <laughs> idea even what digital storytelling was. And that's sort of the joy of this. You never know what you're going to get. You can do all the prep you want. People go to the workshop, and they are, like, green. And they maybe didn't follow directions in terms of what you should do to come to the workshop. And so how do you deal with that as a, as a researcher? Um, so basically, uh, one point I want to make is the number one. We had one workshop in that project, ten stories. Now, recruitment is always a challenge. Okay, so we had only three people Wait, this is a different product. I'm conflating the two. That was something else. There was the Viral Hepatitis Project, which you didn't actually be a storyteller, but there was um, the other project about cancer and health disparities that he was a participant. With the Viral Hepatitis Project, we did three people in a workshop, and then I tend to, when space is available, do one-on-one -on -one storytelling. And I work with individuals, and I have people, colleagues like Daniel and others, that help me with the scripts. But you gain the story, but you lose the magic that happens in the pro in the workshop itself, like the story sharing, which is this incredible. Uh, basically, it's a big group hug kind of thing that people get sort of stuff off their chest, and they learn how to be effective um, uh, commentators on other people's stories. But how do you process input from others? And, and then, Marty, just to add to that, what it also does, if you, because this is another thing that happens with organizations and the people that they're serving, and they're trying to, make, for example, maybe get their stories. And so um, it all actually creates a cohort of, galv of people galvanized to the cause of that, whatever that is that you're working on in your research. They're like, they know each other now. They're more likely to do something together to be active within that community. Things like that. So. I'm so glad you brought it up because that magic, that group hug, typically when I do a digital storytelling workshop, I get another project. 
because I basically am building relationships with people and I'm finding that someone finds it so cool that they want to learn more about it and maybe take it in a direction I never even thought. So the, the model itself can be applied to anything. On the way here, I was saying I would love to do a project about you know, how marijuana in Colorado is like this blossoming industry. So how are people's lived experiences actually being, un, how, they, how are they unfolding? And I'd love to do, you know, the kinds of uh, people that work there. You know, what are the health effects? So there's any issue, you can apply this stuff. And apply it maybe in a more experimental way or less rigid way than we do. Because I think one thing I agree with Daniel, when you do a digital storytelling workshop, it's not you getting messaging in someone's story. You're presenting the space, you have themes, and you just pretty much keep your fingers crossed that their, their story with the right structure or guidance fits into your themes. And if you want to force it into it, then we kind of say you're sort of losing the point. And so, so there's a lot of uncertainty, and I sort of celebrate that uncertainty, and I enjoy it. So well, we handle that with prompts. Yeah, with question prompts. And these are the prompts. I mean, certainly, like, if you have 10 survivors of rape and sexual assault, and you're inviting them into this space, and you're doing it ethically, meaning they're applying for it, they've seen the process, they've seen the product, they have some idea this isn't the first time they've ever told this story, hopefully. Like, you try and make sure of things like that. So we have a, an ethical framework for it. You're inviting these people in. Um, they know what they're coming for, more or less. But still, yeah. the stories may or may not be useful to you. Yeah, and I think to make – I'm so glad you clarified that. Because, yeah, there is some order in terms of, like, you know, the, the story prompts. But I think the way I work as a professor, when I get participants from the community and I say, here's the themes – as best you can write about something. But what I find when they're actually introduced more deeply to the process, they may have a better story about something else. And typically, in most of my research, it's all mental health related. And so I basically provide space and say, if you have a better story to share, you should go for it. If it's not directly related to smoking or not related to hepatitis, you know what, let's just run with it. And then I find it's just, it's, it's just really powerful. Now, what a digital story is not, it's not a PSA. And I'll let you briefly, we won't show it, but what, why, why isn't it a PSA? Like, what do you think about um, the issue of us as public health people trying to communicate our work through a PSA rather than a digital story? It's been my experience that PSAs, um, people tend to tune them out. They're real heavy in, uh, you know, information, uh, but they're really lacking on that interpersonal level. So when we watched that earlier digital story, I mean, I think everybody is moved by stories like that. They're very powerful. Whereas when you start to see a PSA, your eyes kind of glaze over, your mind kind of turns off, and they're really not that effective at getting that information through. And so let's show one digital story made in the viral hepatitis project. It's very short, um, and then we'll, I'll wrap up quickly. When I was 50 years old, I had two boys. There's something about the plug in on that. I had lived in Denver all my life. I should test it. This one, I might have to play it in like VLC or something. Got it. And if it doesn't work, it's fine. We'll go ahead and keep talking. Okay, so that digital story is one of 10. And if you haven't grabbed it, we have a compilation DVD here. Is it which, on the desktop? Which, it's uh, on the desktop in the folder right there. And then uh, it's the top. If we can play it in here. So, when Stupid digital. Why do people do digital anyway? Here we go. Sorry about that. When I was 50 years old, I had two boys. I had lived in Denver all my life. I used to be head custodian of the hospitals, St. Anthony and St. Joseph. I had to work around a lot of sick people, but I was never sick myself. When I was 30 years old, I began to change. I started using drugs, I stopped working, and I had to hustle to get my bills paid. My kids went to live with my mother. When I went to the joint, I found out I had hep C. I was 40 years old, for years, my girlfriend and I would go to City Park to shoot up. We would go in broad daylight to keep our habit up. 
we would boost stereos and other things from Aurora Mall. We had the same dealer until they would get knocked, and then we would have to find someone else. Sometimes we would get too sick to get up to even go look for dope ourselves. You got to go find somebody we trust to give our money to. After I got out of jail, I kept doing dope. I remember how much it hurt one day when my grandkids sat on the couch and asked me what was wrong with my hands. It was really from shooting up. It left a bad source, but I told them I got in a car accident. Lying to them hurt me so I started to try to kick. I went to the meth clinic at Arch on 18th and Gaylord. I even went to a Rappel House drug treatment for six months because I need stability. I tried kicking dope a few times before and it didn't work. But this time I got better. I stayed at the sobriety house for six months. Then I went to groups at Empowerment and Sisters of Colors. I got a sponsor. Today, my experience with meth is rough and it's costly. $180 a month, which is way more than I can afford. But I am thankful for all the help I get. And I'm glad that I can sit on the couch with my grandkids without lying to them today. So what was interesting about that project? Um, I'm trying to make sure to talk about the right different projects going on. Uh, we put these online, and there was a survey using Survey Monkey. And so, um, you know, what we did is uh, here's something about potential uses. Yeah. So what we did is we're now analyzing um, the findings. Be zoomerang, you know, the whole zoomerang stuff done. And I think um, the bottom line with the data analysis is that I can get a paper or two done with people like um, a storyteller here who his experiences and his story and his knowledge of viral hepatitis can help us contextualize it, link to literature, but also recognize that the data is sort of synthesized into one or two videos. And then we talk about that. Narrative. We can talk about the, the process of production. We can talk about the uses. We can talk about other things that are necessary that can help uh, colleagues in hepatitis in public health, but also to um, create new questions about this methodology. And did you, and we just have like less than a minute, any questions or not questions, additional things to add about kind of what we're doing or the project itself? I think really quickly for the project, I was just hoping to get out prevention messages, risk factors, so the basic, you know, stuff that public health would want. But it, like Daniel said, or uh, and Daniel and Marty said, you have to kind of keep your fingers crossed and hope that that stuff comes across. But when we actually had all the stories done, they talked about everything that I would have hoped would have come across. So it came out perfectly because they were able to talk about that stuff in a real personal way that made it extremely um, accessible. And um, so it, it really did come out well. So I'll, I'll stop there. There's so many different things to talk about, like incentives, the ethics of visual imagery, how to look at non-traditional allies. I think in digital storytelling, at least the work I've been doing, there hasn't been a lot of work with faith-based organizations, which I found with community members are huge in terms of uh, mental health issues and coping. Um, and so that's it for me. And I I'm sorry I went over, and I appreciate everyone listening, and we're resources here to chat more. Great. So let's open this up to questions now, both um, in person and on the phone. Looks like we already have a, a question. Please. So I, I told you how I think we met Marty a long time ago. I'm trying to get real. Mm, yes. Uh, 
So um, now I work with children and I run actually a youth board focused on mental health. And I am really passionate about um, developing a story. They just developed a photo application called Luminate the Darkness that I'll travel mm. around the state. Um, but my question is kind of turning this process, which is like community organizing, into research and kind of what we're, and perhaps maybe have a catalog some more like lessons learned, I get through the IRB. I can imagine it's going to be a, if I try to do it with young people, it would be a quagmire of difficult. Uh, great question. Thank you. And it's good to see you again. I, I think um, I may have said this two years ago. You, Your job is to educate the IRB, and there's no reason you should reinvent the wheel. I'm happy to share all those te the boilerplate text. Um, and it's not a difficult process. It just takes time and patience, you know, in terms of the IRB stuff. I'm a firm believer, and this is about money, that if you're going to get a group of people to come to a workshop, they should be adequately compensated for their time. They should get equivalent, depending on the population, 10 to $15 per hour. So you have a 24-hour workshop, and you have three days, and you have, if you want 10 workshops, you know, factor that into your budget. Because I think the community members that I know are just tired of, you know, participating for free. Um, and I think it just builds, um, you know, a level playing field in, in my perspective. So it's just building off kind of one of the points that you said. And IRB, that stuff you tie into the IRB. And there are plenty of other methods, like similarly, you know, there's a uh, breast cancer researcher at University of St. Louis who's doing a bunch of, got a cancer center NCI grant to do dig what he calls digital storytelling, but it's video interviews with African American women who, have, uh, who are going through treatment, and he's checking out. And so the video interviews, you just need 45 minutes with someone. But it's a completely different process for them. And the product is completely different, too. It, it just depends on what fits. I mean, he's like showing them to high-risk African-American women's groups in um, Washington, D.C., and seeing if that versus a pamphlet saying, here's the risk, here are the stats, what's more likely to get you to engage in the you know, same with, with your work and have see what's more likely to get you to engage in a, like, you know, for example, kind of for a mammography, hearing someone's story or seeing a statistic? I could ask you the last time you guys changed something in your life, was it because of a statistic or a story? <laughs> anyone have, <laughs> seriously, anyone's statistic? Was the statistic that got you to stop smoking? If you smoked? or whatever, or was it last time you actually made a life change, was it due to story? Uh, think about it. Okay. Um, so I have a question. And so this is really so interesting. Um, and it, but my question is really about analysis. So I was intrigued, Marty, when you said um, that you, uh, in, in at least some cases, asked them to, uh, to, to develop their story around certain themes. Mm -hmm. They didn't always uh, do that, but that was the goal, at least at first. So, because usually when we think of um, of qualitative analysis, we think of like the data are, you know, they exist, and then we analyze them for themes. But you've kind of reversed that at least a little bit, right? So I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, how the analysis happens, and you know, do you look across stories for other emerging themes that came through, or or what? Yeah, great question. Of course, uh, you must be a professor. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about first the, the stuff that is guiding the analysis. So when I do my workshops, if things go well, I have lots of data. There's the storytellers themselves and all the participant observation notes that I take, so my field notes. There's sometimes interviews that I do outside of the workshop with them about their experiences. There's a pre and a post. There's um, the online stuff that may directly relate to that story. And so I have all of this qualitative data, which is basically text and or imagery. And so the analysis itself is, it's, it's some people would say it's a little postmodern, it's a little uh, non-systematic or not necessarily falling into the traditional public health model on how you analyze. I basically, basically set criteria in my head that are consistent with the project themes and then begin to sort of drill down to some of the bottom line points that I want the analysis to point to. 
It, well, let me rephrase that, because otherwise it's like I'm driving the paper to make the conclusions that I want to come up. I just basically find a digital story that I thought worked well, um, like for example, the one we showed today. The chapter that we write may just focus on that. And so what we'll do is we'll work together, lay all the uh, data around us, and we'll just try to find overlapping themes. Uh, we'll try to find compelling points that stand out or are unique, and then we will do, and I, you, you asked this last time, then we will do some comparisons with the other material including the themes, the storyteller experiences, the uses of the digital story, uh, how it relates to the findings from the survey, and then, of course, um, look at how it fits into the larger context of the literature, what people are doing, not with just with digital storytelling, but with narrative analysis and then maybe policy, or in my field, like the anthropology of policy, change of policy, um, uh, uh, like um, implementation. So, so my approach is, again, it's sort of uh, non-systematic, it's an interpretive analysis. So we may have the whole chapter we write revolve around one image out of that theme and then through interpretation and then um, uh, assembling the data in some organized way, just make some flowing narrative that puts together the whole picture of the project from the perspective of that digital story and then the lens that we put up, which is the analytical stuff and all the other terms that guide the um, the, the paper itself. So I, I'm not here to say I have this uh, approach. Um, I just am here to say uh, I sort of let the digital stories and then our assessment of them and analysis of them sort of guide the narrative that tends to be the final result of what you call a peer-reviewed publication. And so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, So that's a response. Daniel? <laughs> Anything to add? Well, I don't do as much of the research, so I'm not sure, sure that that's necessarily applicable to me. Sure. And I think historically, a lot of For the time... For those of you who need to go, we have there are some handouts here about work. If you haven't picked one up, I think Marty has DVDs of the yeah, project, too. Grab. So if that's something that you want to grab on your way out, you yeah. can touch. Exactly. And actually, on this note, we should probably uh, close because we're going to lose the line in just a minute. And I know other people one. have uh, things to go. It is 1 o'clock. But please join me in thanking Marty and Daniel for this presentation. Also, we haven't um, signed the sign-up sheet. I know I seem obsessed about that, but you know, it's helpful for us to know how many people have come. Please do that. Please pick up the... Um, the materials that they have there, and uh, and of course, uh, can you guys stick around for yeah, a few minutes yeah, to answer any other yeah. questions? Yeah, there's one thing I do also want to point in here is that we are having a free webinar like a, that we're leading um, in public health. It's a national thing and maybe international. We'll see who comes in, but um, it's free. And if you're interested in coming into the webinar and seeing more of this, um, that's great. Great information's there. Maybe I can. That's wonderful. Yeah, please. Yeah, and, and um, well, pay uh, please you know, keep an eye out uh, for an announcement about our uh, presentations coming up in the 14-15 year. So our next presentation will be in September, um, and uh, you may get a few uh, announcements between now and then about exciting things like this opportunity too. So thank you all so much for coming. And thanks for having us too. Year. Oh, thanks for, thanks for listening. being here. And right. so, uh, Lynn, the other board grantee, uh, we're actually co-authoring a book together, a compilation oh. um, set of chapters, and I got two or three other publications, one specifically about the therapeutic qualities of digital storytelling, to try to assess from an individual storyteller's perspective, and I showed her a video last time she came, Wanda, uh, African-American deal with schizophrenia in her um, life and in her digital story, so we're actually co-authoring that because uh, she happens to be a grad student in film at DU now, oh, um, which is a direct result of the digital storytelling. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, it's, cool. it's incredible. We're going to turn you all into filmmakers. You, you'll never watch a movie the same way again after a <laughs> one. But I think what I'm learning here is there's room open to people who are more quantitative oriented or want to use a mix of qualitative methods to actually assess and analyze this stuff. And I think there's lots of great models out there. Uh, I just know for my interest to present to community members more than just a peer-reviewed publication, we have to look sort of beyond that and look at the other things about providing them with resources, providing them with the space so they can do the digital storytelling themselves. And that means maybe less time writing stuff up. And so I have a history of sort of not writing things up. So I'm backlogged in data because I have so much. <laughs> you said your students in grad school will spend twice the time working on a digital story than they would on a traditional research paper. I'm so glad you brought that up. In all of my classes, students are given the option to do digital stories. And I don't know how often 
you guys co-write or work with your students on their papers, but I pretty much spend a lot of time with each student to provide them with that experience. And so if you haven't had a chance to do that, I'm happy to share that model or, or give you the empowerment to get your professor or your own self to make space, space in the classroom to do scholarly digital stories. Uh, so yes, usually three times When's harder. the last time your students actually shared their work with each other? At the end, they all watch each other's stories. So again, it creates a pretty interesting. Yeah, it's community. fun. It's great. And I usually do them off campus and get food, um, and it's a lot better than like, oh, hand in this paper, fill the scantron out. And people, I think, learn from that experience in a way way differently than a normal class. So if there's any questions or constructive criticism, I think we're happy to deflect it or answer it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need to go, feel free, of course, to, to leave. But uh, if you'd like to stick around and ask questions, feel free to do that too. Thank you all so much for coming. So do you teach out of the Department of Anthropology? Yeah, yeah. And what, what are these courses called? So one's Current Theory and Ethnography.